Good evening, and uh, I'm very happy on behalf of uh, ACT and uh, Chennai Architecture Foundation to welcome you all for this uh, evening. Uh, some of you may not know much about CAF, so just a sentence or two about it. It's a small collective of architects uh, who organize activities, uh, first in a, with a lot of self-interest to develop their own uh, way of looking at uh, both city and as well as architecture in the city. And also, hopefully, through various conversations, expand the constituency for good design. Hopefully, not only they get more projects, but also sort of build a better city, which is Chennai, that's their interest. Uh, today, we have uh, assembled for an unusual lecture, I should say. The first unusual aspect is there will be no illustrations. Yes. But can you think of a lecture on architecture and uh, buildings and without any illustrations? And that's something only a non-architect possibly could even uh, dare to think of. Uh, so that's the, probably the first unusual feature. But there is something a lot more unusual about it as well. Uh, architects keep talking about uh, design. And they take a lot of pride, and I'm sure uh, Trudeep, you would have possibly sat through many in Sept and Mike uh, and NID, who all the time talk about uh, the great ideas, but uh, less, uh, if not seldom, about making and materials. But only in the recent times that there is a little bit of what they call the material turn, and now architects have started thinking about it. Uh, now we all assume that that's taken for granted, and even this, where we are today, that we have started talking about making and construction, that's also primarily through uh, the, the idea of technology. The technique and the technology is what concerns, but probably you uh, would hear an entirely a different perspective about uh, making and construction. Uh, the kind of uh, deep prejudices some of us hold and how uh, um, when I say us, I mean mostly architects. I do include, though I'm not actively practicing. Uh, and uh, how much effort has gone in, and here in this case probably through uh, the views and ideas of uh, one person mostly, and the kind of engagement that he has had, and what those ideas mean even today, and how relevant those conversations are. Uh, and there's no better person to turn than to Trudeep to talk about uh, not only Gandhi that we, some of us may know, as ex he has extensively written about, but he's also a great storyteller. And uh, I've had the benefit of almost listening every alternate of weeks, uh, morning 10 o'clock, for a cup of tea, uh, while uh, as I'm also as a passive smoker, not an active one, while he is. Uh, so these wonderful stories that he used to share uh, about almost everything under the sky, but today uh, on Gandhi. And I've heard, uh, heard about some of this earlier occasions in, uh, on, on, on different, uh, uh, what do you call it, forums. And I always found it's a very fascinating combination of uh, a wonderful story with an insight that is not slapped right on top of it, but beautifully narrated and leaves a deep impact uh, with those uh, thick descriptions and the events that he could put together in a very interesting fashion. And uh, Srudeep, in my view, is the go-to person for anything on both Gandhi studies and as well as the uh, cultural history of uh, Gujarat, and not to mention the gossips and the very spicy stories that you would possibly only hear, not hear, probably if you come after uh, this lecture for a dinner. And he has a wonderful grasp of the politics, uh, not only the current politics, but the politics of uh, institutions and as well as people. And some of that we we'll probably get a glimpse of. Uh, he's currently the provost of uh, SEPT University, where uh, we are colleagues. And earlier to that, he was the director of uh, Gandhi Ashram and uh, one of the key persons uh, to set up the Gandhi archives. Uh, and earlier, he was with uh, NID and MICA and uh, many design institutions. Though he's uh, not an architect by training, but he has had wonderful exposure. 
and also sitting in one of the best campuses for five years, which is the Sabramati Ashram. You have the old and as well as the new. And uh, we are very uh, we're thankful and honored to have him here. Sudeep, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, namaskar. And uh, Namaskar Gopal Sahib, um, your affection is boundless. Thank you very much. Um, the Russian poet um, Klebnikov, Viktor Klebnikov, spoke of the police station as an enchanting place. He says, what a fine place a police station is. That's where I have my tryst with the state. Then he goes on to say, that's the place where the state tells me that it exists. Um, but if you are really, really very reflective, that's also the place that you might actually find yourself. Uh, and that's the story, that's the point where I wish to begin with. 10th March 1922, Gandhi is arrested and taken to a police station. Um, nothing unusual for him, nothing unusual in our times. Um, it is the habit of the state to arrest people, and some people are habitual offenders and they get arrested. He's taken to the police station, and in a police station you are asked to fill up a form. And he fills out a form in which you have to write your occupation. And there is no hesitation in that writing. He wrote that he was a weaver and a farmer. Six years before, he'd filled out another form, not at the police station, but in a good Gujarati way, seeking um, subsidy from a subscription. Because if your income was lower than a certain thing, the literary association in Gujarat charged you less, less fees. So he wrote that he subsisted. He was a teacher subsisting in his own income, which was less than rupees 30 a month. What had happened between 1916 and 1922 that somebody who was trained as a barrister, who practiced very successfully as a barrister, um, you know, don't go by everything that he says in the autobiography. Uh, he was an extremely successful, very effective lawyer in South Africa. Um, remained a very great legal mind. So don't, don't go by the hesitation of the young person that you find in the autobiography. What happens to a barrister whose self-image for a very long time remained that of a trained legal person to move from being a barrister to a teacher, then to be a weaver and a farmer? If it were not Gandhi, we might be tempted to say, or be, even in case of Gandhi, we might be tempted to say, here is this man making a large political gesture. He is trying to connect with the world of farmers, with the world of weavers, and we should really not take that seriously. What I am going to urge you to do is to take that moment in Gandhi's life very seriously. Uh, that, that it's not a gesture as far as I'm concerned. It's a very profound move in his own self-understanding of who he is, his relationship to his body, but also to work, something fundamental, and its relationship, I would urge you to think, with freedom. So I think Gandhi's conception of freedom, not just as political freedom, but as Swaraj, capacity to self-rule and rule over self in both the senses, um, Swaraj, rule over the self, and self-rule are two different things. Uh, even when you do not have self-rule, you can have rule over the self. So in that sense, so there is a relationship that I wish to establish over the next 45 minutes with his engagement with work, with his body, with what he's trying to do with the material world, and the idea of freedom that he's begun to think of, something that we might have lost sight of. There's nothing in his background which tells you that he is somebody who liked physical work. Uh, we know that as a young student in Rajkot, one of the, the only class that he wanted to bunk was the physical education class. And, and he would, um, 
he couldn't even be persuaded to do physical training because you could be stout like the Englishmen and defeat them at their own game. He began to look at his body very differently, we know, when he goes to London as a young student. Um, that's when he begins to walk. And walking is something that would stay with him through his life until the moment of his death. Uh, he died walking, uh, walking to prayer, walking to meet his Ram. Uh, and so the act of walking, but the act, very self-conscious act of walking, um, it's not the kind of walking that we fashionably speak of as being a flaneur. Uh, somebody who is unattached to the city observes it. It's not. It's Gandhi discovers himself and London through the act of walking. And that is something that would stay with him in South Africa. He becomes somebody who walks. Um, he's also somebody who trains other people to walk. But we're going ahead of ourselves. The only physical labor that he does um, um, which is unusual, um, or physical work act on himself that he does, um, he's learned to shave himself. Now, modern men and women find that uh, um, it's not a great skill, you would say, but uh, in the 19th century, if you did not have your own barber, um, that was a slight uh, you know, um, problem. Uh, people got themselves to a barber periodically to have themselves shaped. So he is very, he writes about, uh, about how he looked at um, his relationship to the act of shaving, um, the mirror, and the recitation of the Bhagavad Gita. He would tell you that it's as a student in London, while shaving himself, that he began to buy heart the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, now, I'm not going to recommend that to everybody. Uh, um, it requires dexterity of the mind and the hand, which many of us may not possess. So there's something which is beginning to happen with his relationship to the body and the self-consciousness in a very self-aware way to a very young person. South Africa is the first time that he would try out other forms of physical work for himself, not for others. Um, learn to starch his own collars. Um, barristers wore collars and they needed to be starched. Um, disasters. Um, he was a butt of jokes. He went a step further, decided to cut his own hair. So there is a set of, um, and you can imagine even for Gandhi, cutting your hair um, is a, uh, not an easy thing to do. Right? Uh, um, he was asked if the mice had come and um, um, taken his hair. What's, what I'm trying to tell you is that he's somebody who's beginning to think of the body and his relationship with the body in a way which is very different and he's moving towards what we would then call self-reliance. Not in a very grand sense. It is saying, can all the functions of my body all the needs of the body can be met by my own effort. And he's beginning to very consciously think of that in the nine, um, as a young person. Um, of course, um, we know that he, uh, in South Africa, he adopts two other practices. He begins to kill clean shit, his own and other people's, people who live in his large house. But here is somebody who's overcoming the first prejudice that most of us have of cleaning our own shit. Um, and it required a physical act of emptying out the night soil. It required a physical act of removal of chamber pots, cleaning them, bringing them back in. There is also the very infamous, um, and as he says, shameful incident where he is irate with Ba Kasturba because she has not yet overcome that sense of revulsion with shit. But that's the first transgression in terms of 
your relationship with the most vulgar of materials that we don't speak of. That begins to happen. The other thing that happens is he also begins to think of disease. And body in pain, body which is wounded, body which has been subject to violence. The autobiography gives us only some senses in there that here is this person who comes to him who is physically in pain because he has been assaulted. And that's when Gandhi's other lifelong passion uh, of being a nurse, uh, very important. Uh, he, uh, he thought of himself as a nurse, not as a doctor. Um, when he was less um, self-indulgent, he called himself a quack. But uh, between quackery and nursing, an entire world of dealing with body in pain, body in disease, uh, which, as you know, uh, would culminate with him working with leprosy. Uh, but that's, that's, that's a story that we will come to. But the first act of nursing, very conscious act of nursing, also begins in South Africa. Something that his family and the, the community that he had come from had told him was something that we did, people like us don't do. We don't deal with body in decay. Uh, we don't deal with disease, we do not deal with illness, it requires very familiar touch, and touch is something that all of us abhor, uh, touching other people that we do not know. Uh, the act of touch and being touched uh, as an act of affection, of care, of, of giving, is not part of that universe. It's again in South Africa, that he would begin to think of uh, agriculture as a mode of building a community. But more than agriculture, it's the printing press. We know the story uh, of him being assaulted uh, on the docks. One of the rumors was that not that he had only come, he had not only come with a shipload of Indians, but it also come with printing presses. Printing press has always been feared by state. Um, and in an institution of um, journalism, you should be very proud uh, that the object that we deal with is something that those in power fear. Gandhi's Phoenix community is a community imagined and created around the printing press. If you were to remove the international printing press from Phoenix, and think of it only as an agricultural community, you, it would not be a sustainable community. The purpose of coming together in this 100-acre farm that he bought uh, outside of the city uh, was to create a printing community. It's a community around printing. Uh, the idea that Gandhi is a Luddite, understands no technology, requires some amount of reframing for us. From that point till the last day, there is not a day that he does not own and run newspapers. He edited, printed, proofread. Um, South Africa clearly did a lot of proofreading of the newspapers. But it's a community around the act of printing. It's a letterpress which needs to be arranged, which the treadle has to be worked. And so the first, the idea that a community needed to work with its body to sustain itself is something not as an individual, not as professionals, but an entire community participating. Those of you who have read accounts of their community life in South Africa would realize that it's then the idea of each one contributing bodily labor to sustain not only the newspaper, but the community begins to take shape. Um, each one of them uh, would learn to do sharira shram, bodily labor. That acquired a different kind of resonance the moment prison going became a thing with him. Um, somewhat uncomfortable, the place is. Um, South Africa probably more so. 
uh, and it o was always accompanied by hard labor. So the idea of work and, and work leading to work as punishment is something which has been part of long tradition. Work has always been part of, there's been a deep association of enforced work with both slavery and imprisonment. And that's something that we should bear in mind. And it's only now, uh, in some parts, that we've been able to break that relationship between work and a state of unfreedom. Only, only in some parts, not, not entirely. Uh, but it's in the, in the South African jails that Gandhi has to rethink his relationship to the body, work, community life, the food that you eat, and so the Phoenix community, uh, which was a happy community, which remained a happy community, a community that laughed, a community that cared, a community that played and made kites, we know, and, and um, uh, you know, rolled in drums and um, so uh, went fishing, um, the, the river next door. Uh, that community changed. The notion of hard labor and training the body for prison going through hard labor enters the consciousness of the entire community. So here is this community, which Gandhi would later say becomes self-consciously a satyagrahi community, a community not only those who uh, follow truth, believe truth, uh, hold on to it with steadfastness, but also are capable of making great personal sacrifices for the sake of that truth. Uh, and in the lot of the Satyagrahi, prison is something which is a constant. So that Phoenix community becomes a community which becomes a training ground, as it were, for Satyagraha. And, and the body in prison, body in prison which is willing to be confined, willing to be put through great hardship, but also do enforced labor. And, and so the timetable enters the Phoenix community. You wake up at a certain point, uh, you, you get a certain kind of community meal, uh, you put in certain amount of work, then you put in hard labor which is different from work. Train your body to be in prison. So the relationship of hard labor and imprisonment and the striving for freedom is something that becomes very clear to him in South Africa. The other thing that happens to him in South Africa is an architect, um, Herman Kallenberg. Uh, very, very renowned, very successful, the buildings that he built in South Africa still stand. They are very prized now. Um, uh, he, was, he was an architect in the European tradition. He was a maker. He thought of himself as a mason, a cabinet maker, kind of a farmer, a bodybuilder in the image of the great Sando that um, um, the images of Herman Kallenbach and that early images are very, very, uh, he's clearly somebody who goes for a run. Um, and with him, Gandhi acquires another practice. And that is a practice that will stay with him in a very transformative relationship with material. It's on the 21 miles outside the city, on the Marion Hill, still stands a monastery of the Trappist monks, um, which is where Gandhi learns to make sandals. Now please understand, making sandals is the most unusual thing for an upper caste, well, even a middle caste Hindu. It is the most unusual thing for somebody who is not a chamar. Among the things which are most polluting 
in the Hindu worldview is leather. And we will come to, to that. I don't think Gandhi is conscious at this point. He would have been conscious of the fact that it's very unusual because nobody around him clearly had ever worked with leather. Um, not in his community, not anybody around him. It comes to him as a deep Trappist spiritual practice and somebody who has a very European modern sensibility where making and making something well has a value of its own. Let's pause here and why is leather, the move to leather is such a profound move for Gandhi and, and, and very deeply transforming. And that is one part of the Gandhi story that we have chosen to forget. That Gandhi, to use a very fancy new term, is the first chamar chap. I, know, I hope you know that there is this very fancy brand coming out of Bombay of leather called chamar chap. Um, I, I like to think of Gandhi as the first chamar chap. What's happening? The Hindu society, as you all know, um, is hierarchical. Um, there's division, but there is a notion of inequity, but inequity based on a notion of purity and impurity. Purity and impurity which is ascribed to us at our birth. The Hindu worldview then moves from human society. I don't know whether it moves. It, it encompasses both the human world and the material world. It's the only worldview that I know of which has an equal hierarchy of purity and impurity ascribed to materiality, to material world itself. We know that those who deal with scavenging both human waste, but of course the most basic scavenging that we need to do is to remove the dead body of the humans and the animals. So those who deal with the death of human person uh, or scavenge the characters of the dead animal are the lowest sociologically, culturally in the purity index. Slightly above that are people who deal with shit. So if you look at waste, waste in any form is polluting, ritually polluting. Not just polluting in terms of sanitary conditions, it is polluting. It is impure the, and the relationship of the worker and the material becomes entwined in a way that we are unable to distinguish between what is more impure in our worldview. But it does not stop there. Every physical activity, every material, you know, um, many of you are architects or studying to be architects, or even if you're not, it doesn't really take very much to know that all materials have properties, not innate properties of that material, but ascribed properties. So in our worldview, a sunar is better than a luhar. So a goldsmith is better than an ironsmith. An ironsmith is better than a suthar, somebody who does carpentry. A carpenter is ritually higher than a potter. So a kumbhar, so there is a relationship of hierarchy which is based on our understanding of pure material world between objects or materials like gold to, to earth, so from a sunar to weaving, agriculture. So you have a material world and material practices 
which increasingly lead to greater and greater impurity and therefore greater and greater oppression, dehumanization, exclusion, all work of the body in the Hindu worldview pollutes us. What does not pollute us? Pure immateriality, what I do, pure thought, untouched by any material. It's only when you do not deal with any material thing that you acquire ritual purity. So Gandhi was somebody who was at that point part of those who did not have to do any. It had, he could have been like me, dealing in pure thought and even better because he was a far better thinker. But somebody who did not have to work with his hands. From somebody who did not have to work with his hands, who had actually trained himself to work only with his mind, he begins this journey and lands himself in the world of untouchability. He becomes, even before he becomes aware of caste and its relationship to untouch, exclusion, untouchability, he begins to adopt the practices which would render him untouchable. And the first major, apart from dealing with shit, is self-consciously working with leather. We know that that activity continued through his life, although most institutions which are devoted to Gandhi's um, work and life prefer not to speak of it. We have, um, as a token gesture, named one kind of design of footwear as Gandhi Patti Chapels, the, the, the most elegant, basic, three-strap thing it's as minimal as a design can get. If you remove one element, the structurally the chapel fails. And that's really the kind of minimalism that he's attained. But that's also something that comes to him from the Trappist designs. But that's not the only chapel that he makes. He made five, we know, five different kinds of designs for footwear in India. He also knew the relationship between footwear and public sphere. We forget that stepping out, for most of us now, involves wearing footwear. And in many instances, stepping inside requires either a change of footwear or removal of footwear. But if you had no footwear, what kind of a public realm would you participate in? Very few people know that under Gandhi's influence and encouragement, I don't know what is a piao called, but um, where, you, where you go and you're given water for free and nobody asks what your caste is and what your community is. What, so there is a water fountain. Um, he created in Gujarat, and I saw among the last ones, uh, and, um, and I happened much after Gandhi, um, footwear piaos. Men and women going out could actually borrow footwear in the village or in the town, wear them to do public activities which involved politics. Because for women going out uh, to participate in public gatherings required probably shorting their feet in some kind of footwear. The last one that I saw was in my town called Anand where you could actually go pick up footwear and deposit them back at the end of the day or at the end of your need. All of these things happen. So there is a relationship. Gandhi's public sphere is another story. But we have to understand that he carefully crafts what we call the public sphere, not in the European sense of creating a public sphere in which we moderns understand. But each aspect of being in public from dress to footwear had to be crafted. Uh, Gandhi's movement in that sense is very ennobling and very bewildering because he is looking at, for example, um, um, the, what is called salwar kameez. 
Salwar kameez as political dress is something that owes its origin to a lot of discussion that Gandhi has, uh, including with, with this afternoon talking about Nudila Sarabhai uh, and, and, and the kind of dress that Congress women begin to adopt and all the long advice Gandhi would give to women associates as to how they should not wear saris but wear salwar kameez. So Gandhi is crafting the public sphere, but that's another set. But leather plays a very important part in the crafting of that public sphere. But let's get back to that act of being a chamar. He would remain a lifelong committed to working with his hands and being work. So in the Sabarmati ashram, there was a tannery. The memories of that have been erased. Even physical memories of that has been erased. But there was a tannery, an active tannery. So he picks up leather there. The other practices, because un clearly under the influence of Kallenberg, he becomes a carpenter. And not a mean carpenter, he could fix a roof. Um, he also learns to design, design, build spaces. Um, Let's not forget that he, to use a modern parlance, he did the master plan for the Sabarmati Ashram and designed many of the dwellings there. And if you were to look at the trusses in Radai Kunj, these are trusses which only an expert European architect could have done. There is nothing vernacular about vernacular. I know uh, there is. Uh, outside of the world of architecture, vernacular is a bad word. Uh, in architecture, is sometimes somewhat more respectable. But there's nothing native about the trusses that Gandhi designs. These are, you know, technical king post trusses which come to him from um, Kalimbak. So he becomes a very fine carpenter. He begins to do mapping. Um, don't think that this Abhirmati ashram is organic. It's actually linear. It's, it's on a grid. It's, it's only because we don't have a perspective from above that we think of it as, you know, it must be a kind of a circular space. I mean, there is space which circulates and people who can move about, but there are very neat 90 degree lines in which the dwellings are placed. Begins to become an architect. Um, architect in the sense that he begins to have a sense of space, how to design it, how to create it, how to build it, how to care for it. So he becomes a mason and a carpenter. There is also a very rare photograph of Gandhi trying to fix a roof in Phoenix, uh, on a ladder fixing a roof. The other thing that South Africa gives him is a very clear understanding that an act of caring, any person who thought himself as a caring individual, required caring of the body of the other. Now, we self-care is something that we know of. Caring for the people who we are affectionately bound to, we understand. But caring for the other, who is not me, who is not part of my world of affection, is something that has now been rendered professional, but which is what doctors and nurses do. Gandhi brings the act of caring as part of what a human person should do. Not only as a human person, but a person aspiring for freedom, needed to expand the circle of care to include those in pain, those wounded, both in battle and otherwise, he begins to care. So, and the kind of, and, and um, it's not an easy thing to care for a decaying body. We know that. Um, it's not easy to care for a body that is in pain. And he is somebody who's constantly, uh, after South Africa, if you read his letters or the letters that he receives, a lot of them are about caregiving and receiving care from others. But he, he begins to do that. Um, 
Those who know the history of medical profession and medical training in India know that the great obstacle to medical training in India was Indians practiced untouchability. No Brahmin wanted to touch a non-Brahmin body for a very, very long time. And therefore, the first autopsy that we performed in 1853 was received with a 21-gun salute from Fort William. Advent of you know, first march of modernity in India that a Brahmin male has overcome his revulsion, cultural revulsion of the dead body and an autopsy is performed. So there has been a long relationship of, of touching a patient, as we call it, and its relationship to caste. All bodies in India bear the marks of their caste. Begins to care. When he comes to India, he acquires two other self-practices, something that we all um, like. He began, begins to become a spinner and a weaver. Weaving is something that he refers to in that 10th March 1922 form filling. We have, very, we have rarely seen him weave. We've only seen him spin. All the images that we have are Gandhi the spinner and rarely of Gandhi the person who wove. Um, as you know, both anybody who's a bunkar uh, in large parts of India uh, is an untouchable. What he makes into a national fetish as a national duty, the symbol of India's struggle for freedom, um, one act that comes to your mind is an act of ritual spinning. But not just a ritual spinning, an act of spinning. He creates organizations called the All India Weavers Association, All India Spinners Association. He's somebody who's thinking systematically, structurally. He has a marketing team in place. Uh, he has economists in place who are looking at debt, who are looking at saying, what how many hours of activity will produce how much yarn, how much yarn can be sold at what prices, which will lead to what yield in terms of yardage. So there is the economics of it, the organization of it, which is there. And I'm not, um, I'm not going to burden you with all the details. But there are these two very, very important. I mean, today, uh, what remains of it is something called the KVIC. Um, 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 but the, it has its roots in the all India Weavers Association and Spinners Association. Also in, 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 in um, the, uh, called the Swadeshi Melas that began to the, the Indian industry that came. Now if you were to think that Gandhi was interested only working with hand and there is no implement at play here. Um, I'll give you two illustrations. It's not, I keep telling, I keep telling myself and everybody in Ahmedabad, it's no accident that the National Institute of Design came to Ahmedabad. It was, you know, there are all these stories of how um, it was to go to Agra and, you know, um, the last stop uh, was Ahmedabad and um, Gautam and Gira Sarabhai said, you know, it can't go to Agra, it has to be in Ahmedabad and, and before, um, the report reaches Pandit Nehru. They've already set up an institution and goes to Nehru. He said, you have a report, we have an institution. But there is a reason why that happens. India's first design competition, which carried a price of 100,000 rupees, is launched in 1927 uh, by M.K. Gandhi, which is to do a more efficient charkha, spinning wheel. He was a clever man. So in his lifetime, nobody got it. Everybody kept improving the charkha, but the price went to what we call the multi-spindle spinning wheel, which is the, what is, goes under the name Ambar Charkha. Um, 56 is when the price is awarded. So the competition stays on from 1927 to 1956, uh, which is a pure design competition. With his own spinning wheel, you realize that he is constantly doing an act of bricolage. He's constantly adopting it to his needs of his body. One of the needs of his body is that he rides with both hands 
because the hands tire out. There is, you know, there is a writer's elbow, there is a tennis elbow, but we know that there is something called a spinner's elbow. When you keep pulling the thread for hours on end, so he wants a charkha that can be can be worked with both hands. He wants a portable charkha. So there is a desktop charkha, which is you know, stationary, but he wants something that can be put in a bag and carried like we do a laptop. In, in actually, it's sold as a laptop charkha right now. It, it has a name called laptop charkha, which is made uh, in the carpentry units uh, near Sabarmati. It's called laptop charkha, but it's actually what's called the Yaravda chakra, something which is designed and manufactured uh, in Yaravda while he is a prisoner, which allows the entire instrument to collapse and, and be carried in, in, in a bag. So he does uh, manufacturing. Um, his own spinning wheel at Radha Kunj, if you were to see, um, has wind breakers. Right? I mean, there is a movement that happens, and, and the smoother the movement of the wheel, um, easier it would be on ourselves, but also the finer the yarn would come because there is less resistance. So he's actually introduced an aerodynamic um, windbreaker in the, in the handle of the spinning wheel that he has. So there's the only one that I have seen which has that windbreaker introduced uh, in, so he's constantly doing the act of bricolage with the charkha, trying to improve it, minimize it. Um, long discussions you would see, diagrams being sent back and forth uh, about how to make uh, the takli more robust, how to do something called dhanushya takli, or dhanushya charkha, which is just a bow. And, and you, can you spin with a bow? Can you minimize the act of spinning, which does not even require this instrumentality of the spinning wheel? Can you just do that uh, with a spindle? Right? And, and, and so he is constantly thinking that. He is, but we don't know of his as a weaver. I would urge you to go to the Sabarmati Ashram um, someday and request them to show you uh, the most priceless uh, object there which is the sari that he wore for Ba. Um, people would, you know, I mean, this is a kind of a modern affliction that we have, and I would get asked this question while I was there. People have stopped asking me this question now. Did he love Ba? And I had to find, uh, um, so every time somebody said, did he love Ba? I would take them to the archive in the repository and take out the sari, the most exquisitely woven sari. Forget, um, and I, I know something about weaving, because all of us wear hand-woven cloth. Exquisitely woven sari that he made for Ba. It's it's um, it's printed. Um, there's block printing. Uh, there's madder dye on it, and there is golden khadi uh, block printing that there exists. He made two of them. One she was cremated in, the other is what here. He knew how to weave. But not just, it's not about act of weaving. It's what is it this signaling? He is, Gandhi is signaling two things by his entire range. Of course he designs toilets. Um, 26 designs are what have been documented. It's something called the Safai Vidyalai, uh, which is part of the Harijan Ashram Trust. Uh, there is a toilet museum, but he's somebody who is thinking both in term, he's thinking of a design solution to both a sanitation problem, but also a cultural sociological problem. If you were to remove the act of cleaning and removal of the night soil, can the degradation and the dehumanization, which is associated with both the material and the act, could be reduced. So he's thinking toilets. Uh, of course, he's thinking of cleaning. Um, he think, continues to work with a um, range of materials. Um, we, do, I, we don't know if he actually worked. Uh, he didn't work with precious materials like gold. But everything else, mud, of course, um, he is somebody who treats you and heal you with mud all the time. 
right? Mud packs uh, are his favorite thing. So if he really liked you, he will either give you an enema or a, or a mud pack. Uh, not a very good thing to do. Uh, 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 great affection. Uh, everybody he, he loved was administered an enema. And, So there's a range of materiality. What is he doing? He's saying that one, that we need to have a different cultural relationship with the material world that we inhabit. If we continue to have a relationship of abhorrence with the material world, we will continue to have a relationship of disdain with all those who work with hands, which is everybody except a few. No society can subsist without people working with their bodies, working with their hands. And if a social structure and a worldview makes those who work with their hands, with their bodies, as less human, dehumanizes them, castigates them, treats them as outside the pale of any civilization, that society can't think of freedom because it has bound a large part of its population in an act of unfreedom. What you needed to do was to free this society through an act of work. So that's why you would not, never see Gandhi without an act of work. We know that he had a difficult relationship with the camera but he had come to terms with the fact that he was going to be photographed. Do you, very rarely would you find Gandhi not working with his hands in any of these massive archive of images that we have. Um, the least that he would do would, you know, um, that he would be working with a fountain pen. Fountain pen reminds me of two stories and I'm gonna stop with those. All of these that we've spoken about require working with hands. And, and the argument can be made, well, did he have a view on industrial production? Um, not far from here, well, far from here. Raj Mundri um, still has uh, Ratnam pens. Um, please go online and please buy them. They need to be supported. What's happening is, Gandhi, of course, is using German fountain pens and German ink because India does not make fountain pens. So here is this, in, in one of his great tours of Andhra, a young person comes in to him, says, Bapu, mujhe kaam dije. I mean, give me a mission in life. And Gandhi says, do you know how to turn a lath? He said, of course, I know how to turn a lath. Make me a fountain pen. Young Ratnam and Gandhi collaborate, and there is a back and forth that happens Clearly, various products were designed, discarded, refined, till in 1932, Gandhi writes to him that the fountain pen that he's received works. India's first fountain pen is designed in collaboration with M.K. Gandhi. He's not satisfied because a fountain pen, most of you forget, also requires ink. There is no ink. Ink has to be produced. India's largest producer of industrial ink today started producing ink at instance of Gandhi, Hindustan Inks, which is um, a company, which is a massive company operating out of Daman and Silvasa today uh, in, in near Gujarat, part of Union Territory. Um, Hindustan inks is something that starts manufacturing ink as part of the Swadeshi exhibitions that Gandhi. So Gandhi says now that, you know, writing is freedom, we all understand that. Um, but here is a fountain pen, which is a Swadeshi fountain pen. Here is an ink, which is Hindustan ink. He is somebody constantly thinking of problem solving as a designer would, as an organizer would. But most importantly, what he's urging us to do is to say the act of freedom 
for most of us lies if all of us begin to work with our hands. And in order to work with our hands, all of us will have to learn to be untouchables. And therefore, when people, when Gandhi says that I think of myself as an untouchable, he is not making a political gesture. He is making a statement based upon a deep, profound understanding and relationship with the world of materiality and how do you transform yourself and that material in the act of making. Thank you very much. Don't forget that the first person to publicly work with the leprosy in our country is Gandhi. Of course, then the great saint comes, but um, first person to actually get a person of leprosy to come and inhabit that community that he is part of, and where Gandhi himself personally cares for this body, which is actually in decay. Is Gandhi. There is this very, uh, very moving image of uh, this great Sanskrit scholar who comes to die. Um, imagine coming to die at Gandhi's house, um, and, and 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 he is a leper. So, uh, it's it's not. I mean, what I'm trying to say is that it's a profoundly thought through, felt, lived relationship with everything that is abhorrent to most of us. What I didn't emphasize enough is that there is also a division of gendered labor that happens. And in the act of spinning, you know that uh, weaving is done by men and spinning is done by women. Right? And, and there is a very self-conscious fashioning of the woman's labor that happens in the national movement where everybody um, is made to do almost urged to do part of the activity of the woman worker, which is the act of spinning. Um, except for a few communities in the Northeast, women do not weave. And even there, the women do not weave the shroud. The most important garment that you could ever think of is the shroud. I think we've done a great disservice to ourselves uh, and to Gandhi, and I'm not worried about Gandhi, he'll take care of himself. We've done a great service to ourselves as society, not thinking about the relationship that the freedom struggle had with fundamental categories like work, fundamental categories like organizing around work, labor, materiality, a Brahminized, clean Gandhi is not what we need. We need that person who's transforming himself and us and our society through a deep engagement with labor. If you turn him into a mere scavenger, that's all right. Um, but there is something more than just an abhorrence of dirt. Thank you very much, and, and thank you. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to listen to Trudeep. Uh, not only the stories could be entertaining, but it could also be very inspiring and provoking. And uh, not only the man, but what he did and how he did it. And uh, after hearing from him, I thought when I read uh, a book recently, Peggy Demers, which is titled Architect as a Worker, I thought it was a radical proposition, but I think it's not so radical a proposition, but a fundamental proposition to begin with, and that's probably a takeaway for architects here and the students here. Thanks, uh, Trudeep, for coming and uh, sharing these wonderful stories, and thank you, ACJ and Sashi, uh, for hosting us here. Hopefully, we'll see you in another lecture, I don't know when, 
Uh, we'll let you know and we'll probably circle it and hope to see you more, if not here, in spaces, which is our regular venue. Thank you.